Hey, welcome. Come on in. Um, I'm going to open us in prayer, and then, um, then we'll talk more about the class and what we're doing here. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna, the prayer I'm going to pray is a prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, a great theologian from the 13th century, so let's pray. He was a great theologian. We're doing a, you know, this is sort of a class on the content of the Christian faith, hence the appropriateness. Okay, all right, so let's pray. Ineffable creator, through the treasures of your wisdom, you have established three hierarchies of angels, have arrayed them in marvelous order above the fiery heavens, and have marshaled the regions of the universe with such artful skill. You are proclaimed the true font of light and wisdom, and the primal origin raised high beyond all things. Pour forth a ray of your brightness into the darkened places of our minds, Disperse from our souls the twofold darkness into which we are born, sin and ignorance. O oh God, you make eloquent the tongues of infants. Refine our speech and pour forth upon our lips the goodness of your blessing. Grant to us keenness of mind, capacity to remember, skill in learning, subtly to interpret, and eloquence in speech. May you guide the beginning of our work, direct our progress, and bring it to completion. You who are a true God and true human, who live and reign, world without end. Amen. 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 Um, that's a really lovely prayer, and I love to mm -hmm. contemplate it. Membership. So this class can serve in several ways. It can be like a general going deeper class, or sort of basic, uh, basic sort of aspects of Christian thought and faith and practice class. It can also serve as a membership class and a confirmation class. And so of the different people who signed up, some will be using it in different ways among those. So um, I'll say more about this, but we're going to record the content. We're not going to record conversation. Uh, but but um, anyway, so there, there will hopefully be a way if you need to miss some night that you can get the so there's like, there's content in this class, there's also conversations, and I really look forward to the conversation part of it. Um, I want to pass out, actually, some syllabi. So, is that appearing? Yeah, this class is calling understand, Understanding Christianity Through the Lens of Love. I'll say more about that in a little bit. But, you know, the image on the email that we sent out uh, has a telescope on it. And so the idea is these really big things that are complex, like a telescope, uh, sort of zooms them in and, and sort of increases our power of perception. So the thought in the class is that approaching Christianity through the lens of love is a very faithful, uh, significant way to sort of get a good understanding of those big things. And so like y'all see, we're gonna uh, meet here at 5.30s on Wednesday, Wednesday nights. Um, so if you haven't signed up in any kind of official capacity, please give, do so with Megan, and that would help us all to be in touch. Um, so I mentioned this can be a basics or going deeper class, it can be a membership class or a confirmation class. Um, and we're starting today with introductory stuff, so I am gonna lay down some content and we're gonna dive into that. Um, next week, we're going to talk about uh, the question, does God exist? That's fun. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, you might, I think there's an answer to that question, actually. I don't want to leave you in suspense. Uh, I'm not a pastor who doesn't think there's an, an answer to that question. Um, but uh, the next few weeks, we're going to go through the articles of, of the Creed, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, and sort of study the shape and the content of Christian faith will be interrupted on March 2nd by Ash Wednesday. After that, on March 9th, uh, we'll talk about sort of the history of the church, not just the Methodist church, the 2,000-plus-year-old Christian church. Like, you know, 20-minute 20 20 minute presentation, 2,000 years, should be easy. That should be easy. No, there'll be, I could foresee no problems with condensing that material. Uh, after that, spring break, so we'll skip a week. And then after that, there's several weeks on sort of the shape of Christian life. And we'll be looking at sort of the Ten Commandments as they're understood in the church's sort of tradition of teaching and catechesis and forming uh, folks in the Christian faith. And so that sort of involves reading the 
um, Ten Commandments and studying them through the lens of Jesus' love commandment, love God and your neighbor. You sort of line those up and the shape of Christian life appears. After that, we'll have another week off because it's Holy Week. Um, and then near the back of the class on April 20th, you see, we'll study sort of the way Christians worship. Uh, strangely enough, you, you might see, think, uh, but there's a sort of common shape to Christian worship across the centuries. We'll study sort of what that looks like. Uh, and uh, then the next week we'll study baptism. What's the meaning of baptism? And then last we'll look at um, sort of local church membership. What are the promises that one makes in becoming, deciding to be confirmed or deciding to be a member uh, in a local church? So that's sort of the shape of the class, where we're going, uh, and it'll involve some scripture and things like that uh, every week. Any questions that arise for you so far, just looking at the shape, or any logistical kind of questions I haven't touched on? Okay. Um, Well, then, in a second, I'm going to begin the sort of presentation. And the thing I want to say is, um, I think, like, feel free to interrupt or raise your hand or dive in there in the midst of the the presentation. That's wonderful. We're going to be recording. So if you do that in the midst of the presentation, know that you'll be recorded, and it may or may not be able to be edited out, okay? Uh, uh, but if you don't mind and you just want to keep, I love it. It's really fun. You can take me off on a tangent. It'll be fun. <laughs> uh, and so we can, we can explore that. So feel free to d- dive in, but just know that during the little presentation section, which I hope most weeks will be, um, 15 and not more than 25 minutes. So 20 minutes ish of sort of teaching material. But beyond that, I want the weight of this class to be just open conversation, sharing, exploring things, stuff like that. Um, uh, here we go. You can see that there. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, understanding Christianity through the lens of love is the title of this class. I'm on major bullet point three, if that's helpful for you. Roman numeral three. Um, understanding Christianity through the lens of love is a very characteristically Wesleyan way of proceeding. Um, so it's very, in doing and sort of thinking through Christian faith like this with sort of love as the guiding theme, it's a very characteristically Methodist or Wesleyan way to approach it. Um, it's not a narrowly or a sort of, that's not an eccentric way to approach it. There's folks of all the different parts of the Christian family who would say that's a great way to see the thematic continuity of Christianity uh, across different doctrines and across the centuries. Um, so uh, my view is that this uh, approaching it through the lens of love Uh, is not a fad. It's not an eccentric way to approach it. It is orthodoxy. It is the intellectual and spiritual project of Christian orthodoxy, I'd say, is to think through Christianity in light of the revelation that God is love. Um, Point B there. To do this, to think through Christianity in light of love, is to start sort of at the end, at the culmination of the Bible, at the back of the New Testament. Um, There are many uh, New Testament passages that talk about, you know, God being love. First John literally straight out says, God is love. God, love is. Hatheos agape, agape love. Estin is. God is love. Um, Similarly, like in Romans 8, you see Father, Son, and Spirit all talked about. Um, The Father's love for the Son, the Son... uh, is talking about suffering and death and rising, and then us participating in the sun's dying and rising through our prayer and through our own sufferings. We're sort of wrapped into the life of God. And then that assurance in Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So no suffering, no good, no bad. Um, you're connected to Christ through the Spirit. You participate in Christ. Nothing can break that divine love. Um, so Jesus is teaching. He teaches love God and neighbor, that this is the, um, that all the law and the prophets hang on this, right? Um, this is, love is the thing, the love commandment, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This is what the sort of law and the prophets depend upon for their coherence, for their intelligibility, for their meaningfulness. 
Um, so in Jesus's teaching and what's revealed through Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, what's revealed is that God is love. Okay, if that's the case, that becomes then the, the fullness of re- the, the picture of like what God is like, but then we understand everything else in light of that. So that becomes uh, the lens through which we view the cosmos, the world, and through which we interpret scripture. Um, and so there's, it's sort of like, you can think of it like, you can think of God revealing God through scripture sort of like this in a certain way. It's sort of like a, um, you know, like this, like, uh, God, like think of scripture, OT and new T, new T, Old Testament and New Testament, sort of like a pedagogy. And most of the Bible is Old Testament. And God's revealing more and more of who God is. What's a pedagogy? Oh, yeah, thanks for saying that. Okay, uh, a pedagogy is a sort of ordered program of learning. The education term for this is like scaffolding, scaffolding. The things you have to understand before you can understand the next things. All right, I'm so glad you said that, Tanya. Uh, and any, anyone, or is that Megan? It was me. <laughs> yeah, Mass, Tanya, I'm sorry. Uh, well, that's your, your help. Blame her for the next little yeah, issue. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, all, we will, for, for recording purposes, all questions will come from Tanya. <laughs> no. Um, no, 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 so, okay, uh, so you can tell I talk fast. Uh, sometimes I use words that I'm using as I'm talking fast. Uh, if they're not a word you're familiar with, interrupt me. Thank you. So thank you, Megan. Definitely do that. All right. Um, pedagogy. Yeah, an ordered program of learning. So the thought is something like this, that um, the culmination of the scriptural program of teaching is this sort of God is love, Trinity, you know, God is Trinity, this eternal relationship of love, and that's all revealed in Jesus, uh, you know, dying and rising. <laughs> there's, there's, there's the cross and there's the rising. It's an up arrow. That's great. Uh, <laughs> so glad to share my art with you. That's a J for Jesus. All right. So at the back of scripture is revealed um, that God is love. But then once we understand that, so the Israelites like live through it. And there's a way we each sort of live through it in our own lives. Uh, and we have to understand foundational things before we can get the depths of this Christian claim that God is love. But once we start to get it, the more we start to get it, the more we sort of read backwards and sort of re-understand the story of the scriptures in light of the fact that sort of God is love all the time. It's not just when we started to understand that God is love, that God became love. The scripture isn't the story of God sort of like growing up and maturing and finally becoming a nice guy. A nice God. No, the claim is that in Jesus is revealed what God is like always and for everyone. And so then we can sort of start the thing over and understand it all in light of this ultimate lens of coherence that God is this eternal relationship of love. All right. Is that making some sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good times. Good times. All right. So, so I'm using this word revelation a lot. And you'll notice that I couldn't help provocatively titling the lecture, this class one today, Introduction to the Apocalypse. <laughs> yes, that's so exciting. Um, the, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's what we're about here. Um, this Greek word apocalypsis, apocalypse in English, means revelation, revealing something that hasn't been visible. It means unveiling. So uh, scripture talks about Christ as the sort of revealed or unveiling of the mystery that's been hidden since the foundation of the world. Um, so essentially, uh, you, you know, and Paul, oh, I wanted to go to this, Galatians 1.12. Um, Paul uses this language very explicitly. When he's talking about, oh, I'm starting in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Oh, actually, I'll start in verse 11. He says, For I apprise you, brothers, that the good tidings of the gospel proclaimed by me are not of human origin. For neither did I receive it from, nor was I taught it by a human being. I received it rather by way of a revelation, an apocalypse, is what he says, from Jesus the Christ. Okay? So, 
God has revealed this gospel uh, in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So um, he's unveiled something about God that was hidden or wasn't fully visible before. All right. So now I'm in that Roman numeral four section, uh, Revelation, Apocalypse, or Unveiling. So the basis of sort of Christian study of what we're going to be doing in this class and the basis of Christian life and the basis of like the crazy stuff preachers say uh, at church, <laughs> and the basis of the stuff that you say in church uh, when you take part in the prayers and the liturgy, um, the basis of all of that is divine revelation of God's revealing who God is, what God's like in such a way that it matters for all of life. And as I've been driving home again and again, and that number one there, paradigmatically, God's revelation is in Jesus Christ. It's full in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean, then, that God's only revealed in Jesus, but that uh, through that lens of Jesus, we can see God everywhere uh, and sort of understand God. Were you going to raise a question? Yeah, what's Paradigmatically? That? Yeah, yeah. Uh, What's another word for paradigmatically, decisively, definitively, most clearly? Um, so God reveals who God is in Jesus uh, in such a way that it becomes the sort of oh, the sort of guide or rule for how we'll then see it elsewhere, how we'll see God elsewhere. Thank you. Um, you're welcome, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Colossians 1 says that in Jesus the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 1, 15, I believe, says that Jesus is the image or the icon of the invisible God. Okay, so again, scripture emphasizing that um, Jesus reveals God. Um, and that is the basis of Christian teaching or doctrine it's the basis of theological reflection. Um, so uh, that um, point 2A there on the handout, right here, um, there's a way in which learning to think and learning to pray like a Christian is a process of learning to think and live and relate everything to Jesus Christ. Uh, as Stanley Harwas liked to say in his Texas accent, um, it, he's an ethicist and theologian at Duke, he would say, in Christianity, everything relates to everything else. <laughs> um, so the coherence of everything is in some way Jesus Christ. So in 2 Corinthians 10.5, St. Paul talks about taking every thought captive to Christ looking for the thread of coherence in everything, or thinking everything rigorously in the light of Jesus. Um, St. Bonaventure, a great 13th century Franciscan theologian that I like a lot, says, Omnis cogniciones famalanto theologiae. Every cognition serves theology, or is theology's servant. So thinking uh, any, and this is like, Sometimes there can be this view or this worry that when we go to church, we think Christian stuff, but like business, life, <laughs> relationships, the stock market, whatever, none of that other stuff relates to the Christian stuff. But the claim that's, that Paul's making and that the New Testament's making and that Bonaventure's making is like, no, um, everything in some way relates to Jesus Christ. And so... Christian life, Christian spirituality is then a process of becoming aware of that and living in light of it or thinking about it. All right. um, another significant presupposition of um, this claim that God reveals God's self uh, is just that point B there. God wants to be known. <laughs> um, God wants to be known. God is, in one way, 
inaccessible to our, the grasp of our understanding because God's not one thing among others. God's not one of the things that's created that we're used to seeing and touching and thinking about in all of this. Okay? Um, God's invisible, as the scriptures say. Um, but, uh, nevertheless, and all the more, God wants to be known. God makes God available in Jesus Christ to be known. Um, and so, uh, our best rational efforts, our best philosophical efforts to understand God, uh, the harder we work is if we're working at theology, if we're working at prayer, all these efforts to know God or to understand God or understand what God's doing in our life, these are already responses to a God that already wants to be known or that always wants to be known. Um, to say that God is revealed as Trinity in Jesus Christ is to say that God is revealed as a mystery of self-communicating love, self-outpouring love, something like that. So God is always already working to make God's self known in our efforts to know God, in our efforts to respond. Um, this is one way that Christians could make sense of the fact as we'll get into a little bit more next week, that people of various cultures and religious traditions uh, have thought that the existence of God is rationally knowable or even demonstrable. That's wildly different than how we sort of think about these things in the West sometimes. Um, nevertheless, uh, if it is the case, as Christianity says, that God is, desires to be known, um, then it makes sense that, you know, as um, St. Paul says uh, in Romans 1, all people in some sense have known the existence of God and God's power on the basis of the things that are made. Okay. Um, what's another way to think about this claim about revelation and why it's so decisive for knowing God? It'd be like this. Um, Think about a friendship, um, and uh, 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 I think I, I'll, 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 I'll talk about a, a friend of mine named Travis that I played in a band with. Okay, uh, and later we became great pals and would read, you know, drink coffee and read books and talk about them and stuff like that. But uh, when uh, uh, we first met, we were in 1920 and was playing in a band together. And you meet someone and you. Um, you know, uh, you uh, see their appearance and you start to guess certain things about them, right? You form this picture of them, right? You can make a certain amount of progress that way. Uh, some of your ideas about another person you meet based on sort of appearance and seeing how they walk and what they do and what they're interested in, some of that may be spot on. Some of it also might be wildly off, right? What's the way to get beyond sort of your educated guesses or your inferences about someone based on sort of their appearance. Well, it's nothing else than having a conversation with them that's predicated on trust, the Christian word for trust is faith, um, in which they share something about themselves. They share what they deeply care about, what motivates them, what they're about in life, and you trust them. You and that relationship of trust believe them. And that's the basis of friendship. Okay. Um, that's sort of the dynamic of revelation, is that it means that um, our knowledge of God, the knowledge of God that comes through Christ, isn't a dry, mathematical, philosophical knowledge. And it's not just speculating or conjecturing in various directions about God might be like this or God must be like this. Um, it's no, uh, God <laughs> taking the initiative, even in our curiosity, has revealed God as God is in Christ, such that there's the possibility, not just of sort of abstract speculation and guessing about what God's like, but no, uh, of actual relationship and friendship. Um, I started with a prayer from Thomas Aquinas, and Thomas Aquinas is one of the most rigorous thinkers in the Christian tradition in terms of sort of 
the transcendence of God and the way in which a human cannot comprehend God. But Thomas would say that, and at the same time he'd say the most amazing thing is when Jesus in John says, I no longer call you servants, but friends. In and through Jesus Christ, we are made friends with the God who's beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding, and beyond all. That's good. That's good. All right. Um, so when we're talking about uh, God, we're doing theology. Um, yeah. Uh, all of y'all are, you know, now theologians. Um, um, uh, uh, a, a great early Christian um, spiritual writer says that um, the theologian is the one who prays truly, and the one who truly prays is the theologian. So in the effort to form prayers to God, you're doing the consequential work of theology. More pedantically, theology is... Uh, combination of the great Greek words theos, God, and logos, word, or reason, or other things, too. So theos plus logos, um, theology's words about God or the gods. Uh, so the same Thomas Aquinas we were hanging out with says, what's theology about? Sacred doctrina, sacred doctrine or theology, what's it do? It talks about God primarily. <coughs> it also talks about anything else and everything else in as much as God is its first principle or final cause. So essentially that means that the subject matter of theology is primarily God, but since God is the creator and end of everything, lo and behold, theology extends to everything else. So... It turns out to be an uh, all-encompassing and totally unmanageable discipline. Right? <laughs> um, so, uh, alas. Um, that's also to say, anything at all you can think theologically about. It's not some discrete subject matter ferreted off you know, from the other stuff of life. If God's real, God matters for all of life. Uh, something else about theology. Um, it asks wild questions. No questions are off the table. Next week, we'll demonstrate that by talking about whether God exists. How might we think about that question theologically? Um, you might have... Uh, does anyone have an image of sort of uh, the Middle Ages as a place that was really like uh, proper and intellectually conformist and anxious if you step out of line, you'll get in big trouble? Mm -hmm. Does anyone, yeah, certainly one can have that image of the Middle Ages based on depictions of it in, in movies. Okay. Uh, that's an inadequate picture of the Middle Ages, alas. Uh, Thomas Aquinas. I'm talking, Aquinas isn't my favorite theologian. He's pretty great. Um, but he's coming up a lot tonight. The second question in his great work of theology, the Summa Theologiae, at the University of Paris in the 13th century is whether God exists. Hmm. So uh, you can put the ultimate question on the table and put to, on the table the best arguments uh, that can be marshaled on both sides. Um, that's the business of theology. So big questions, scary questions, questions that have ultimate import, that's all in the domain of theology. So uh, in our class, no questions are off the table, and uh, next week we'll talk about the existence of God. All right. Um, what does theology and Christian doctrine make use of in thinking theologically? What are some of the primary resources? We've said at the limit it can be anything and everything. What are the sort of primary pieces? Uh, in the Methodist tradition, we talk about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. That's not something Wesley talked about. It's something that was thought up by a genius named Albert Outler, uh, who lived in the 20th century. All right. Um, 
but the Wesleyan quadrilateral is scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And he's drawing that from Wesley's works and saying, hey, if you see how Wesley theologizes, he's doing these things. This is a revision of a traditional formulation. Anglicans tend to say that theology operates through scripture primarily and also through tradition and reason. And the Anglicans, Wesley was an Anglican priest, described uh, you know, doctrine as sort of a stool with like three, like three uh, legs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Outler, thinking about the way Wesley operates, says that top. Articulate what's going on when Methodists theologize. You need to add, you should add experience. So scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, particularly spiritual experience or experience of God and Christ. Um, we're talking in light today of apocalypse or God's self-revelation. And so one might think of those four as four aspects of the concreteness of God's self-revelation. Those are four places where you can come into contact with what God has concretely done and revealed in Christ. The Methodist Book of Discipline says this, Wesley believed that the living core of Christian faith was revealed in scripture, illumined by tradition, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed by reason. And the Book of Discipline also has a sort of concern to articulate, there's a limited but real priority of scripture among the four. So it's sort of, one, one medieval way to say it is that scripture is the, uh, the Norma, Norman's non-normata, which is fun to say. The Norman, Norman's non-normata. Hey, say that ten times. The norm that um, is not itself normed, but norms everything else. <laughs> so scripture is the sort of, um, uh, the most decisive in a certain way. Uh, but scripture, tradition, reason, experience, all of these can be uh, sites in which we encounter the concreteness of God's self-revelation. Um, sometimes we might wonder, oh great, scripture, tradition, reason, experience, that just sounds fabulous. Yeah, that sounds like a method. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get the right answers, like a math problem. Alas, no. You might have noticed, Methodists use this sort of, sort of method and don't come up with the same answers. Alas. Um, what I'd suggest, though, is that this isn't so much a method that works like a machine as it is a sort of spiritual process, um, a method or way in that sense. Um, one might pray through what one's seeing in Scripture. Here are the ways in which that both corrects what one has seen in the tradition of the church, but also ways in which it can be brought to life by, or ways in which things in the tradition of the church uh, uh, sort of bring the things one's seeing in Scripture and in Jesus to life in ways one hadn't thought of that expand one's imagination. Um, and then reason and one's own experience get in the game too, and ultimately, One's looking, you can treat this as sort of a spiritual process or practice in which one's seeking the harmony of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience and what one's theologizing about. Uh, um, I have already blabbed more or longer than I expected I would tonight. So I'm going to pause right there.